For more content and production, please subscribe to our channel and give us a like. Thank you. We'll begin. Hi, I'm Zakaya, and the reason I'm putting this presentation together is because I wanted to share um, with people the uh, study that I've done comparing uh, four of the Hebrew calendars that are going around out there. I know that there's many more than four calendars, but I've chosen the four primary calendars. Um, the solar lunar Jewish calendar, um, the lunar Shabbat calendar, the Enoch calendar, and then finally the purely solar uh, fixed Torah calendar. And the reason that I did this in-depth study was because I find it um, important to obey Torah. And we cannot obey Torah if we don't know um, when the feasts are to be held. And so what I've discovered is every single calendar that I've looked at will have the exact same feasts identified. So if you look on the screen, these particular feasts that I'm moving around here, these are all fixed. And every calendar is going to have um, the, same, um, the same feasts. And they're going to have, uh, because Taurus tells you what month and what day a feast falls on. So for instance, um, we have Passover is always going to be on one month, month one, on the night between the 14th and 15th. Unleavened bread will always be month one, uh, days 15 to 22. Shavuot in every calendar will be month three, day three. Yom Tura will always be month seven, day one. Yom Kippur will always be month seven, day 10. And Sukkot will always be month seven, day 15 to 22. So how do we have all these calendars when the word of Yahuwah has set his feasts in place to always be on these particular days during these months? Well, the reason that we have all these different calendars is because people have not been able to decide for themselves um, in agreement, I should say, when does a month begin? How do we reckon time? When is the beginning of the year? And so the purpose of this presentation um, is to go over the different calendars, these four that I've mentioned, and how they have determined the beginning of the year. Um, I am not an expert on the Enoch calendar, the uh, lunar Shabbat calendar, or the Jewish solar lunar calendar. I'm not even an expert on the solar calendar um, that I have decided is the has the most Torah support of all. And I'm not here to try to convince you um, to come to the same conclusions that I've come to um, that basically has, I've decided that the fixed solar Torah calendar, again, is the calendar, in my opinion, that is the only one that doesn't violate Torah and makes the most sense in reality. Now, with that said, I don't believe anybody should <clears throat> follow any calendar based upon what any person tells them to believe in. And that's why I did this study, um, because I didn't want to believe any person. And so I'm going to go through with what I have found, and um, I'm going to start right now. So I'm going to point out what I see in each calendar and what issues I've discovered within the solar lunar calendar that the Jews follow and that many Hebrew roots people have adopted. Um, I'm going to discuss the problems that I've discovered in the Lunar Shabbat calendar. And I'm also going to dis discuss the problems that I've discovered in the Enoch calendar. And um, I'm going to show how 
I've concluded that those three calendars violate Torah. Um, some of the um, key tests that I have personally used to come to my conclusions are, number one, does the calendar violate Torah, which are the first five books of Yahuwah's word? Um, two, does the calendar violate reality as we know it? And what I've decided is that if the, the calendar forces me to violate Torah or my understanding of reality, um, then it cannot be a calendar that I can personally have confidence in. So without further ado, I'm going to start with the Jewish solar lunar calendar. This first one um, is, is this Torah fixed solar calendar, but that's the one I like. Um, but this, I'm going to move on and show you the Jewish solar lunar calendar. On this calendar here, and if you can see, I've got these, um, the feasts that were the exact same in the other, um, the other calendar that I started off with, they're exactly the same. They're, you know, Passovers on month one and so forth. All the feasts are always in month one, month three, and month seven. Okay? And what you'll see here is that um, the main difference is that the new moon, um, the crescent moon, decides when Abib 1 starts. So I have this pointing down uh, to the beginning of the year. Now, the beginning of the year <clears throat> for this calendar um, is the problem. And as you'll notice, I've got um, the end of winter at the beginning and the, be um, I'm sorry, and the, uh, beginning of spring at the end here of the next year. So when we go and look at the reality, and if you can just go to any um, Jewish calendar site, and uh, you'll see that in 2015, um, Abib 1, which is the first day of the year, is actually back in March, uh, March 21st. So it's actually going to be... Oops, a little bit, like, about right there, um, right there. So at the end of winter. In 2016, we've got the beginning of the Jewish year based on the crescent new moon <clears throat> in April 9th. So all the way into the middle point of spring, which, as you can see, it pushes the last month into spring and not in winter, and it also pushes the, the fall feasts, not at the beginning of fall, but in the middle of fall. In 2017, we all, we have um, the, the beginning of the year being March 28th. In 2018, we have the beginning of the year being on March 17th. Well, it's probably closer to here. Okay, and then it's on March 17th, it's in the dead of winter. And as you can see, um, we've got these spring feasts of Passover and unleavened bread happening in winter and not in spring, which is what we're commanded to do is have these feasts at the beginning of spring. And so this calendar, and sometimes um, like in 2021, um, it will, the beginning of the year and the Jewish solar calendar based uh, that starts the year based on the crescent moon sighting can be as early as March 14th. So when you look and you have um, the beginning of the year starting as early as March 14th, we have Passover and unleavened bread falling dead in winter. We have Yom Torah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot happening in summer. Well, you say, what is the problem with that? Well, the problem with that is that Yahuwah didn't just tell us that 
the feasts were on a particular day in a particular month and that we could just really, really decide when the month was. No, he decided that the months were based upon the seasons of the year. And even the Jews who created this calendar that moves these feasts all over the seasons um, have to do some tricks to keep their calendar in line with the seasons. Otherwise, um, we'll be having Passover at the end of winter, like we are right here. Uh, or we could have Passover in the fall or even in the summer if they didn't change it around. So what we have here is if we have, um, uh, like back in 2021, when that's coming up, we can have um, a March 14th beginning of the year. And so when that falls in winter, and it does every three years, this will happen where the beginning of the year starts in winter. But we are to guard the month of Abib according to Exodus 12.2, Exodus 13.4, Deuteronomy 16.1, and Deuteronomy 16, um, well, I have Deuteronomy 16, one twice. We are to guard the month of Abib, okay? We can't think we're guarding the month of Abib when we're moving Abib one all over the seasons. Because if you read in Exodus chapter two and also Exodus 13, you're gonna discover that Abib is very clearly identified as a spring season, a spring month, not ever in winter. Okay, so that alone, when we can see these feasts, sometimes moving as late, you know, as late as here in April, and sometimes as early as right here in, in the dead of winter. And again, it's moving these fall feasts as well. We call them the fall feasts and the spring feasts. Well, guess what? When we start a B1 in the dead of winter, we have the winter feasts and the summer feasts. We don't have the spring and the fall feasts anymore. Okay, so that is a violation of Torah. Another problem with this calendar is that it requires adding a 13th month. Because why? Well, let's just figure this out. The moon cycle um, does not stay in line with the solar cycle. And if we go to Jubilees, um, I know that's an extra biblical book, but some people um, have read that and have gotten some truth from it. But uh, Jubilees chapter 6, verse 36 tells us exactly what happened. And it says, for there will be these who assuredly make observations of the moon, how it disturbs the seasons and comes in from year to year 10 days too soon. Well, any person that has a simple ability to add and subtract can tell you that the moon is still to this day 10 days off track from the solar annual um, seasons that are controlled by the sun. And so because of that fact, um, we have to have every so many years a 13th month added. And when we add <clears throat> that 13th month every two to three years, what are we doing? We're keeping this lunar cycle in sync with what? With the solar cycle of seasons that Yahuwah created. Because apparently they're okay with moving the feasts around from in winter, spring back to winter and fall back to summer. But of course, if they let that go on, it, you know, we would recycle our seasons, uh, our, sorry, our feasts and Moedim all over the seasons. But you know, Moedim, that actually means seasons. So um, right here, um, there's a problem. So in order to fix the problem, because the moon is not in sync with the solar seasons, they have to add this 13th month. Okay? Now, where in the world does it say in Torah, or anywhere in the word of Yahuwah, any mention of a 13th month? 
okay? There is no mention of a 13th month in all of Torah. Now, some people will try to convince you that the prophet Ezekiel, um, because the, the scripture says that the, uh, that the elders came and visited Ezekiel um, because as he was sitting on, as he sat on his bed, Oh, that means he wasn't laying down on his side because remember Ezekiel was told he had to lay on his side for um, the sins of Yisrael and the sins of Yehuda. And so they're saying um, he couldn't possibly have laid on his side and obeyed um, and uh, within a 12 month year. Well, I can talk to people more about that, but that is extremely weak evidence. And it all centers around one little word, sat, S-A-T, okay? Um, my husband can be sitting on our bed, and he might be sitting up, he might be lying down. But if my kids come and say, hey, mom, where's dad? And I go, I don't know, he's, only, he's probably sitting on our bed. I don't know if he's laying or sitting or what. And the fact of the matter is, is that the elders came to Ezekiel's home because he couldn't get up. He was obeying um, Yahuwah every step of the way, okay? So that is their only argument for a 13th month. Now, let me tell you what the proof is for only 12 months. And the, it's overwhelming proof that there are only 12 months in the Hebraic year. And it's proof in the reality that we experience as well. Okay? So, First Chronicles 27, verses 1 through 15, it talks about month by month throughout all the year, captains were assigned each month, and only 12 were assigned. In First Kings 4, verse 7, Solomon had 12 officers each for a month of the year, the word says. Esther 3, verse 7, from month to month to the 12th month, Esther says. Revelation 22, 1 through 2, 12 manner of fruits yielding its fruit every month. Okay, there is many more scriptures to prove that there are only 12 months in the year that Yahuwah created. The Tanakh mentions all 12 months um, at some point. Every month, all 12 are mentioned. And never, ever in the entire Tanakh or in the Brit Hadashah is there a 13th month mentioned. And I'm going to put this before you. This is adding to the word of Yahuwah, and that is against his will. He, we are not to add or subtract from his word. Okay? And again, the reason they have to add this 13th month is because the moon is not in sync with the seasons. <clears throat> and they know that they have to keep these fixed um, moedim, these fixed feasts, um, in line with the seasons. Otherwise, they'll be so out of whack it won't make any sense, okay? Now, let me also mention um, that the Jewish solar, solar lunar calendar, if you go and Google the Babylonian calendar, it is exactly the same calendar as the Babylonian calendar um, with pagan names, um, and everything. In fact, the Tammuz, when they have the month of Tammuz, um, that is probably one of the most offensive gods there is because um, that is the child of Nimrod and Semiramis, or supposedly Nimrod come in the flesh um, of the Babylonian pagan religion. And so, you know, why in the world? Would a Hebrew calendar from Yahuwah, uh, uh, our father who says we're not even to utter or study or anything, the names of false pagan gods, why in the world would we have a calendar that names pagan gods? Um, I have to tell you, we, I don't believe we would. I don't believe Yahuwah gave that calendar to the Jews. I think they adopted it from Babylon 
And if you compare it, it's exactly the same calendar, except for the fact that years back, a man, a rabbi by the name of Hillel, modified the calendar that the Jews used coming out of Babylonian captivity. Okay, he modified it because he decided, this man just decided that the feasts could never fall on a Shabbat because it would violate um, the command to rest on the Shabbat. And that is a whole can of worms, but that is a man-made idea. There is nothing at all in all Torah um, that tells us that the priests cannot do the work in the temple on the Shabbat. In fact, there is a morning and evening sacrifice every day of every week, um, or there was, I should say. And, you know, and so the priests were always working on Shabbat, and they worked on Passover because they, they sacrificed um, the animals. And so, I mean, this just doesn't hold any water. And again, I can focus on that topic um, off, uh, offline. But I will just tell you right now that not or, or putting forth that you cannot have a feast on the sh seventh day Shabbat is not in Torah. And so all the people that are following this Hillel calendar, ca calendar um, that was a modification of the already corrupt calendar that the Jews adopted coming out of Babylon, um, they're in error, and it violates Torah. Um, let me talk a little bit about how the fact that when the moon cycle ends 10 days too early, um, <clears throat> we have a... Uh, if I take this... I'm going to rewind this up, line it up with month one being where month one should be, right? And then month 12 ends where month 12 should be. But when we have the lunar cycle, we've got to shrink this. So now that you can see this, month one all the way, see, we're, we are losing some days. So because we're losing some days every year, we have to add that 13th month because, you know, we're getting out of season every, every year. So um, that's just a visual I wanted to give you. And just so you know, every three, to, every three years is when they add this 13th month, and 10 plus 10 plus 10 equals 30. And so every three years... Uh, they add these extra 30 days because it, it's 10 days too soon that they need to account for, okay? So, you know, we can already see that man is fudging with the very creation of Yahuwah, and it's very dangerous. Um, and I, too, followed the uh, Jewish solar lunar calendar because, of course, that's, you know, when I uh, turned my back on mystery Babylon, in other words, Christianity, and I got rid of the pagan holidays, and I wanted to follow the holidays of the Bible, I only knew to look to the Jews, and so I started spotting the crescent moon, and, and you know, following their calendar, and discovered, you know, that the feasts, it was very confusing, I didn't know when the feasts were, or when they weren't, I hadn't read anything of Torah yet, because of course, you know, when I was taught that that was abolished in Christianity, um, so here I was trying to learn, and the only people that I could look to were the Jews, and that's why so many people are following the Jewish solar lunar calendar, because um, they look to the Jews as the guide, well, there are a number of reasons why we need to not look to the Jews for our guide in, in many things, um, not to mention the, uh, the man-made creation of the religion of Judaism, which is not in the Bible at all. It's man-made rabbinical law added on to Torah. And so we can see that the Jews have no problem adding on to the word of Yahuwah. And, of course, why, if they add on to the word of Yahuwah in the Talmud, why do people not want to question the Jews about monkeying with the calendar when it's, you can look up the um, Rabbi Hillel in, you know, any Wikipedia search and you will see that he changed 
the very feast days of Yahuwah that were fixed. Now, what, what does this mean that Yahuwah fixed the uh, Moedim? He fixed his feast days. In Job uh, 38, verse 32, it talks, it says this, Maseroth is in its seasons. What is Maseroth? Well, Maseroth is what we commonly know as the zodiac. Now, before you think, you know, I'm into uh, astrology, um, I'm not here to tell you astrology is wicked, it is evil, it is demonic, and I don't focus on astrology. But I do focus on the fact that Yahuwah created Maseroth, and it is named in the word of Yahuwah. And so I am not going to ignore his creation. And it is the 12 constellations that work hand in hand with the cycle of the earth as it orbits the sun and, and causes our days and nights and months and years. And every month there is a separate zodiac sign, a separate Maseroth constellation sign associated with that month. Okay, and it says that Maseroth is in its seasons, okay? And like I said, Maseroth, the constellations work hand in hand with the cycle of the Earth around the Sun and the Earth in its own orbit and the constellations themselves. And so the Sun and the constellations together um, called Maseroth, they are set to the seasons, according to Job 38, 32. In Psalm 19, verse 4 and 6, I will say, the Shamayim are proclaiming the esteem of the Almighty, and the expanse is declaring the work of his hand. Day to day pours forth speech, and there, <clears throat> excuse me, and there are no words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their works to the ends of the world. In them, and he's clearly talking about Maseroth, the constellations, the stars, in them he put up a tent for the sun. And it, it is like a bridegroom coming out of his room. It rejoices like a strong man to run the path. It's rising, the sun's, is from one end of the Shamayim and its circuit, or Tekufa, to the other end. I'll get back to the word Tekufa later. Leviticus 23, verse 4, proves that the feasts are also set in seasons, so go back and read that. Um, so I've just established about scripture that the feasts are fixed in Torah. Now, like I said, first off, Every calendar fixes their feast, this little block here. The problem is, <clears throat> is that every calendar can't decide where these feasts that are fixed start. They move them all across the seasons. And I'm showing you by scripture, Job 38, 32, Leviticus 23, 4, Psalm 19, 4 and 6, okay, that the seasons are where Yahuwah fixed his Moedim. He didn't fix them to a, a virtual number that we can move all over the place, all over the seasons, and have Passover and unleavened bread in the dead of winter, and Yom Tuah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot in the, at the end of summer. No, that is not the way it is. Okay? So that is the problems with the Jewish solar lunar calendar. And I've kind of hinted, well, why do so many people follow this? Well, it's because we're coming out of Christianity, we're, we're willing to give up our holidays, and the only people we have to look to is the Jews. And so, naturally, all of us, not knowing anything, not having ever even cracked one of the books of Torah to study it for, to gain knowledge, um, we're looking to people, and that is where we go wrong. We're looking to the rabbis who have, number one, rejected Yahusha and still do to this day, and have created a man-made religion called Judaism that we must not follow. We are not to add to or subtract from Torah. So right here, I'm telling you, um, in my opinion, Following the Jewish solar lunar calendar is an absolute violation of Torah. And I haven't even begun to talk 
about um, the claim that the Torah talks about the new moon being what determines the beginning of the month. Well, I'm going to tell you, they have translated the, the words, the Hebrew words, Rosh Kodesh, they've translated those words wrongly. Okay, did you hear that? Rosh Kodesh does not mean new moon. Okay, the word for moon is Yerek. Okay, or somebody, some people say Yerek. I'm not really sure. I don't speak clear Hebrew. I'm learning Hebrew words. But the point is, it is the moon is not Koresh. So Rosh Koresh means new beginning. It means the beginning of the month. It does not mean new moon. And the reason that our even Strong's backs up this um, if you look it up, that it means the beginnings, the new beginnings, the renewal, okay, that Rosh Kadesh is the renewal. Um, they will also say, well, it means new moon. Well, why does Strong say that, and why do all of our Bibles say new moon for whenever it should say the beginning of the month or the renewed month? Well, I put it to you right now, we've already established that the Babylonian calendar is the exact same calendar as the Jewish solar lunar calendar. And guess what? The Babylonians cited the crescent moon for the beginning of their months. And so we all know that the Jews were sent into captivity for 70 years. They were sent into captivity into Babylon because prior to being sent into captivity in Babylon, they had already adopted the customs and gods and ways of the Babylonians and turned their backs on, on Yehua. In fact, Yehua has said that <clears throat> Yehuda was more treacherous than um, the, the tribe of Israel in the north, who he divorced for idolatry, for doing the exact same thing that Yehuda, that Yehuda was doing. And so Yehua <clears throat> sent Yehuda into captivity into Babylon because they had already adopted the Babylonian gods and the Babylonian customs. Okay, so we're talking, you know, 70 years plus of deep immersion in the Babylonian customs that these people adopted, and they turned and turned away from the Torah of Yehua, and they turned towards false gods. Okay, that is that is a major problem with following this calendar. Okay, and so um, the the new moon is is not backed up as much as everybody wants to to say. You know, well, my Bible says new moon. It shouldn't say that. It is a false translation. Jeremiah warned us. He said that we would have, we'll, we'll say, we've been passed down nothing but lies, and he said that the scribes will be unfaithful, okay? So luckily, well not luckily, because Yahuwah is all powerful, he has given us a way to look back at the actual Hebraic words and to see what those words mean. And so why did it become, why did Strong start to call Rosh Kadesh? New moon. Well, that's because just like we call um, tissue Kleenex, right? Something like that. You know, it, it was a brand name. So tissue, like that you blow your nose with, everybody calls it Kleenex today, which is a brand name of tissue. Okay, it's not the best example, but it's the best one I can think of right now. So because the Babylonians decided that the crescent moon was the beginning of months, um, the Jews knew they adopted the Babylonian calendar and their customs and ways. And so they interpreted, reinterpreted Yahuwah's word from saying Rosh Kadesh, the beginning of the month, and they made it to say new moon. Not that it actually means new moon, it's just that through simply association well, the beginning of the month is based on the new moon and Babylonian calendar, so our Rosh Kadesh, okay, we'll just say Rosh Kadesh means new moon, and now we'll, we'll tell everybody that. And that is, um, that is a mishandling of Yahuwah's word in probably the worst way, because now people are not following the um, set festivals commanded feast of Yahuwah at the right time of the year. 
And um, that concerns me a great deal for myself and my family and for you, which is why I'm putting this presentation together. Now I'm going to move on to the Lunar Sabbath calendar. This calendar uh, has all of the same problems as I pointed out um, in the Jewish solar lunar calendar, but it even further corrupts the Torah. And I'm going to point that out to you and how that is. Um, at the website called, um, uh, what is it called? Let me get to it. It's called the world's last chance.com. Um, you can go there to this particular link right here and you will see, um, you can enter in whatever date and where your location is and you can see what month you are in their solar lunar calendar and their Gregorian. Okay. So I'm going to go back to, um, my presentation. And so that's where I got these pictures from when I was studying, you know, what exactly are they trying to tell me? Because they're telling me, of course, it's my last chance to get the calendar right. And they're the ones that are right. So I paid attention and I did a little bit of studying and this is what I came up with. Um, and basically, um, again, you have, um, the beginning of the month determined by the crescent moon and all of the things I discussed that are problematic with that and violate Torah. And also, um, because it follows the moon cycle that falls 10 days too short, requires adding of that 13th month. Um, but then in addition to all of those problems, it violates the Shabbat six days of work and seventh day rest. Um, and that, that is a huge violation. And they will tell you that they don't violate the working six days and rest on the seventh day. But um, I'm using their own resources to prove to you that indeed they do violate working six days and resting on the seventh. Now, when you go and you um, enter their, your information, you know, they ask you for your zip code and what month you want to look at. And I was looking at the fourth and the fifth month. Well, they call it the lunations. And right away, you can see, um, according to their solar lunar calendar, that, boy, doesn't this look nice? Um, every seven days, we have the Shabbat, right? And then every seven days um, the next month, we have the Shabbat. But here's where I'm going to point out something. I'm going to uh, look right here. We've got... Um, month seven, day one. So that is July 1st. And that is, um, that, that, and now we're going to go look at the Gregorian calendar. And we're going to see, then when we flip over to the Gregorian, that we've got month seven, the first, is actually not on the seventh day, like they have it on their calendar. It's actually on what we call Wednesday. Okay, so their Shabbat this year in the month that we call July was on a Wednesday on the first week, the second week, and the third week. And then on the very next day, they had their new moon um, that happened on their fifth month on the first day. Look at month five, day one, they had a new moon. Now look, their Shabbat then shifted to Thursday and week four, and week five. Now, I haven't studied this thoroughly enough, but I don't know if they keep the seventh day Shabbat on their new moon, or if they just declare that that's the, the, the beginning of their month and based on the new moon or not. But even regardless, let me point this out. If they celebrate a Shabbat rest on the new moon, that means that they had a Shabbat rest on July uh, 15th, and again, the very next day, a seventh day Shabbat rest on July 16th. Back to back, seventh day Shabbat rests. Now, let's go and say they don't celebrate uh, Shabbat rest on their new moon, okay? Then let's, say, let's look at the problem with that. Now, because they had to shift, because the new moon fell not on um not on a Wednesday like it did the month before, but now the new moon fell on a Thursday. So now all of their months are <clears throat> have, or I'm sorry, all of their Shabbats have to follow the moon. So now um, let's say they don't have another rest back to back. They had one on the 15th, so they don't have it on the 16th. 
Now, how many days are between? They have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven days of work, and on the eighth day, they'd have a rest. So guys, what this is showing you is they're either having back-to-back -back seventh day Shabbat rests, which is totally an oxymoron, or they're having up to, in some instances, up to nine days of work. In this, in this instance, they have seven days of work, and on the eighth day, they have a Shabbat rest. So every single month, they violate the six days of work, rest on the seventh day. Now, of course, they get back into sync because then we look, once we start and have our first Shabbat on that Thursday, now look, we have one, two, three, four, five, six days of work, and then the seventh day rest. But what I'm showing you is that every time there's a shift in the Shabbat based upon the moon sighting, the crescent moon sighting, they have to violate the work six days, rest on the seventh day. And they try to make it look like that's not what they're doing. Because you can see here it looks like every seventh day they have a rest. Well, this is just real fancy footwork, guys. It is actually the deception. A deception is when you give the illusion of something being right. But here's the reality, okay? In the month of July, there are zero days between the seventh day rest, assuming that they have another Shabbat rest on the new moon, okay? What the Torah says very clearly, okay, is that Yahuwah established his covenant with us, with all creation, that he worked in creation for six days and rested on the seventh day. And Yahuwah has commanded us to rest on that day and to do no work on the seventh day. And it's continuous from the beginning of creation. It is not changed. Okay? We do not determine, according to Torah, the seventh day Shabbat rest commanded by Yahuwah based upon the beginning of a month. We determine it based upon the first day Yahuwah did work in creation up to the seventh day that he rested. After he rested on the seventh day of that week, he started working again that very next day for six more days and then rested again on the seventh. And he commanded us the same. And he said that if you don't rest on this day, every seventh day, that you cannot, in, you can't inherit the kingdom. Because that's what is going to be set up in the kingdom. Let's just look one more at one more month. And we've got, um, again, we've got the fifth lunation, they call it. And, of course, it looks like we've got every seventh day of rest, right? But no, not really. We've got these Thursday Shabbats. Now, the new moon didn't happen on the very next day. It happened two days later after their Shabbat. So here they have one work day in between their Shabbat on a Thursday, they work on that Friday, and then they have this new moon. Now, I don't know if everybody takes that day, the new moon, and doesn't work and calls it a Shabbat rest or not, like I said earlier. But let's just assume they they celebrate the new moon as, a, as if it's a seventh-day Shabbat. Well, here they have one day of work in between their Shabbats. And let's say... Let's, um, if they just acknowledge that the new moon is the beginning of the month, how many days of work do they have between Shabbats? Because now they have the shift, right? They have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight days of work, and then rest on the ninth day. I don't know um, what Torah they're reading, but nowhere in my Torah does it say that I can rest and then have another rest the very next day, or that I can rest and work seven days and rest on the eighth day, or that I can rest and work eight days and rest again on the ninth day. This is a 100% violation of Torah, and thereby it is not a calendar I can follow. 
Now I'm going to move on to the Enoch calendar. Now, I got, I was almost totally convinced of the Enoch calendar. There's a lot about the Enoch calendar that made a lot of sense to me. And it falls very closely in line with the solar Torah calendar that I have decided on following. And, uh, but there were some problems that came up along the way as I was studying the Enoch calendar. Okay, number one, as I was studying the Enoch calendar, and again, I studied all these calendars with Yahuwah. If this is your calendar, I'm going to obey it. Even if it causes me problems in my life, I'm going to obey, and I'm going to trust you to provide for me. So I wasn't approaching my studies looking for problems, which I'm sure I'll get accused of, but that was not my heart. I was looking just for the truth, okay? And so as I was studying this, and I, I almost adopted it, um, but I ended up having to question the reality of a 365.25 day year. Now, every single year that we experience, according to our seasons, according to scientific data, our year from the first day of spring until the last day of winter is always 365.25 days long, okay? And you'll say, okay, but we have sometimes 366 days, and I will get to that. I'm going to explain that in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> but what the unit calendar insists upon is that there are only 364 days in a year, because in the Book of Enoch, that's what it says. Okay, for those who want to trust in the Book of Enoch and deny reality, they're saying that the year is only 364 days. And they determine not, they don't use the crescent moon, um, they don't use the moon at all. This is a purely solar calendar. Um, but they don't base their beginning of the month on the actual equinox, the spring equinox. They base it on pretty much six days prior to the actual spring equinox, okay? And, um, and this is what's convincing to me because the day that they determine their, um, the first day, um, of Abib 1 is based on the, uh, the day where there's exactly 12 hours in the daytime and 12 hours in the nighttime. Okay, that's what the equinox means. But the vernal equinox is where there's exactly um, 12 hours of uh, daylight and 12 hours of nighttime at the equator. Okay, so um, I, you know, that, that is one positive thing that they went off the exact equinox rather than the vernal equinox. But the reality is, <clears throat> is that I can prove to you that from the beginning when uh, back in ancient days, um, the ancients knew the first day of spring. Uh, they knew when Abib 1 was. And I will get to that in a minute. So what I'm telling you is that any any person that lives in reality, to follow the Enoch calendar has to deny the 365.25 day year that we experience in our reality. And so therefore, the Enoch calendar, um, it tries to say that that extra 1.25 days was added by the Pope. Well, I'm sorry, even though the Pope likes to say that he is the vicar of his Christ on earth, which Christ is a pagan name, um, he does not have the power of creation like Yahuwah does. He does not have the power to create an extra 24 hours, 0.25 um, more day and night. He just simply doesn't have the power to do that. What we experience is what Yahuwah created. 
But to follow the EMIC calendar, you have to, to deny that extra 1.25 days in every year and go with only 364. Now, um, if you wanted to prove that there were 365.25 days in a year, be a scientist for a year, pick a day, and on that day, look at where the sun is rising. And I don't know, like if it rises up between, you know, on the light pole and stand at that, mark the place where you were standing, mark the pole, and every day when the sun is at that same place, you know, count your day. And for as many days as it takes to get back to that time of year, you know, see how many days is in a year when you physically experience the changing of the seasons and you will find that there's 365.25 days in a year and you can test this yourself this is not um the illuminati uh deceiving us and uh lying to us that uh somehow um the nasa has added in an extra 1.25 days Okay, folks, that, that's not what's happening here. But that, of course, is what you have to um, believe in order to follow the ENIC calendar, okay? What happens is they pretend that March 15th doesn't exist. And I'm going to go to the next slide here in just a second to show you that. But before I do, you can see that their months are fixed, but this... Month one, Abib, is just shifted over a little bit because it's six days prior to um, the month of Abib of the actual vernal equinox. So they always are coming up a little bit short as well. And um, everybody knows that the first day of spring is always going to be on March 22nd or 21st. That is when spring begins. Otherwise, we're in winter. Um, but the reality is, is that they determined their Abib one, um, like I told you, uh, based six days prior to the vernal equinox. So that's why this has been shifted over just a little bit. And so you'll see at the end of the year, they have a problem. Okay, so they have to add days um, to their year every so many um, years as well. And again, we're not to add to Torah anything that would require us to add in order to add or subtract, because they're subtracting um, March 15th from their calculations, okay? And I'll explain how they do that. Um, but anytime we have to add or subtract um, from reality and from the Torah, and they had to add an additional uh, additional month or additional week. I don't know exactly what they have to add, but their calculations fall short because every year they're 1.25 days off. So eventually they, their seasons won't line up just like the Jewish solar lunar seasons won't line up with the seasons. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about that. Um, now, when you go to enochcalendars.web.com, you can see their website address right here. And there are other calendars that are out there that teach about the Enoch calendar and the solar, um, the lunar Shabbat and the Jewish um, solar lunar calendar. I'm just, you know, focusing in on what I studied, okay? So you're going to read from this website, and it's highlighted here in yellow. The 365th and 366th added days are an illusion and do not exist, okay? This is what you have to believe, folks. You have to basically toss out reality and believe that the government and the Illuminati and NASA, that they're all deceiving us and that they have somehow created 1.25 days out of thin air, like Yahuwah himself could do it, okay? And here's what they do. Let's go look a little closer. If you look 
314, so March 14th. And then what date does it go to after the 14th? It goes to March 16th. Wait a minute. Where is March 15th? Well, guess what? They call this Joshua's long day on March 14th. Okay? And you can see it right down here on their website. In the regular years, the names 314 and 315 represent one day. I don't know about all you, but this year, when you come to March 14th, okay, you tell me if there was a 24-hour period of time and then nightfall happened and then you woke up the next morning and you had another, I'm sorry, a 12-hour period of time, a tw I'm, yeah, 24, you woke up the next day when it became light again and you experienced a new day a new 24-hour period, okay? They're basically saying that Joshua's long day explains the truth about this supposed illusion of an extra day that the Illuminati or the powers that be have created and made us all believe this illusion. But where is the real illusion? Who is creating the illusion? Look at the text of this 12th month cycle to the left in red. Do you see March 15th? No, you do not. March 15th is said to have been created by the popes. But if the popes had the power to create an additional 24-hour period as an illusion, why would we need this long day? This calendar decept deceptively calls it Joshua's long day. Why would we need this long day if the actual 24-hour period of time didn't really exist at all as this calendar insists, right? They said it's an illusion. It does not exist, right? It doesn't exist. Well, it doesn't exist because they didn't type in 3 slash 15. They're the ones that got rid of a day, okay? But I guarantee you, on March 13th, March 14th, you will have two separate days and nightfall will happen. Okay? There is an actual 24-hour period of time. It does really exist, okay? And like I said here, I assure you, on March 14th to 15th, it is not a long day. There is nightfall. And that day includes a night and is 48 hours long. The illusion is in this calendar that seeks to deny the reality of Yahuwah's created 365.25 day year. Okay? Now, granted, like I said, this calendar is much closer to the truth than the, any lunar calendar, but it still requires adding of days. Now, I want to go down here and explain something, just in case... You know, you've read about the Enoch calendar and you believe that we're being deceived. Now, I'm not going to, I'm going to tell you right now, our governments are deceiving us, okay? There's a lot of lies that they tell us and you have to question everything. But I'm going to tell you right now, they're not lying about how many days are in a year because they can't. They don't have the kind of power that it would take to create a day out of thin air. Okay, so here's the proof that the year Yahuwah created is in fact 365.25 days, or every fourth year is 366. Now they'll say, aha, there, you added a day. You are the ones adding a day. The popes added the day. Guys, no, they didn't. It's simple math, okay? It's simple math. Look at 0.25 equals a quarter of a day, right? Like 25 cents, it takes four quarters, four, four 25 cent quarters to equal a dollar, right? So if we take 0.25 times four, because it's every four years, we get one day. So what does this mean? Every year, <clears throat> every year is 365.25, okay? But every fourth year, we count that additional 0.25 days, that additional quarter day, which every fourth year equals that one additional day. It's not that we're adding that day to a 24-hour period. Well, we're not adding anything. It is, it is, excuse me, 
It is the way you have created it, and I can prove it. If you go to the time and date website, okay, and you go and look at the equinoxes, we've got March equinox, the June solstice, the September equinox, and the December solstice, and you can look at what dates these fall every year until whatever, you know, as far back and as far forward as you want to look. And every four years, you're going to see, well, let me back up a little bit. The March equinox is always on March 20th or 21st, as you can see, okay? The June solstice is always on the 21st of June. The September equinox is either on the 23rd or the 22nd of September. And the December solstice is either on the 22nd or the 21st of December. Okay? So when we have the equinox falling on March 20th, so a day earlier than the 21st, and that same year we have the December solstice, the winter solstice falling a day later than the 21st on the 22nd, guys, that's where we have that extra day. It was not added in. This is all, the, we can test this by the sunrise, okay? And look at the times. You can see that the, there's, there's different times that these um, solar or these um, celestial events occur. And that is where the alteration happens. It is not linear. It's really, it can become really confusing to study this. But once you get it in your mind and you can really study this, it is not confusing. If I can get it, anybody can get it. So if you look on the next year in 2011, March 21st, so it was that later date and it was the later date. So we didn't have an extra year. Here is the earlier date, but here is also um, the earlier date, okay? It's when we have the earlier date mixed with the later date that we get that, that extra thing. So we've got, we, we've taken, um, we have, in every year we've got that extra 0.25, right? So we've got 0.75, right? And then that, that year in 2010 was that additional 0.25. So if we add that 0.25 to the 0.75 from the three years before, we get that additional day. So in this year, um, that is because based upon when the March equinox happened and the, and the winter solstice, which happens, the March equinox is the earlier date and the winter solstice is the later date, it is built into creation to have that 366 day. No one added it except for Yahuwah who created it. Every year is 365.25. Every year. You can see that on here. Okay? So nobody is pulling the wool over our head by telling us that we have to, that we have to calculate based on 365.25 days in a year. Now, why Enoch talks about 364 days, um, all that can tell you is that you have to question reality in order to go with that. And so it didn't pass my test, okay? It didn't pass my test. So I'm going to go back and talk about the calendar that does pass the test and doesn't break Torah. And this is called the fixed solar Torah calendar. It is based upon reality. It, it is completely based upon these dates of the equinoxes the sol and the solstices. Do you understand that? So this year, we had a bead one was on March 21st, okay? And every three months, okay, we had month one, two, and three, and then we, month four started on June 21st. Then we had month four, five, and six, and month seven started on September 23rd. It will start on September 23rd this year. And then we'll have months seven, eight, and nine, and month 10 will start on December 22nd. And then we'll have month 10, 11, and 12, and then month one will start on March 20th, which will be a bead one of 2016. 
okay? And, and it always works like that. It is always the same, and it falls exactly in line with the equinoxes and the solstices, and therefore it is not only fixed, like all the other calendars are fixing um, these uh, the feasts, according to month one, two, three through 12, and putting, you know, the, the Moedim feasts in those counters, but it is fixed according to the seasons. There is no movement. Abib one always happens at the beginning, the first day of spring, and Passover, Unleavened Brad, and Shavuot will always be in the spring in month one through three, Yom Terah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot will always be in month seven at the beginning of fall. And when you read about Yom Terah, it says that Yom Terah has to happen at the end of the Tekufa. Now, I want to just point something out. Your Bible probably says at the end of the year. That is a mistranslation. Okay? It's a mistranslation. That's why the Jews have their new year at the seventh month, which is totally not according to Torah. Yahuwah made it very clear in Exodus 12 that the beginning of the year was month one at a B1, not month seven. Okay? And what that scripture tells us in, about Yom Torah is that Yom Torah has to happen after the Tekufa. The Tekufa is the equinox, the fall equinox. So if we have these uh, feasts falling in the end of summer, guess what? It violates scripture because the feast of Yom Torah has to happen directly after the Tekufa of fall. Okay? The word that translated at year's end, okay, it wasn't year's end. It was, it, it's the end of the Tekufa. Look up that word, look up the scripture, and look, at, look up what the Hebrew word was and how they translated it and misled everybody. Yom Terah has to happen on day one of month seven, and it has to happen directly following the Tekufa, directly following the fall equinox. That is how Yahuwah's schedule works. And we don't, so we don't, follow the moon. We don't interpret Rosh Hodesh as new moon. We interpret Rosh Hodesh as the beginning of the new month. Okay? We determine Rosh Hodesh based upon reality of the March equinox, the summer solstice, the fall equinox, and the winter solstice. That's how it's de determined. And it never changes from year to year to year. And it never, it never falls. It never fails us. We never have a feast that's supposed to be in spring at the end of winter. And we never have a feast that's supposed to be in the fall at the end of summer. We always have our Shabbat, our seventh day Shabbat, on the day of the week that is the seventh day that of course we wrongly call Saturday, but that is what we call it. Because the Shabbat was never to be determined. It was set in place before Yahuwah gave us our monthly feasts, before he gave us the seasonal feasts that were set in place according to the Tekufa, according to the equinoxes, okay? And so the feast calendar is overlaid over the top of the work six days, rest seventh day arrangement, okay? Yahuwah gave us a weekly command, work six days, the seventh day rest. And it's rep repeating ever since creation. Never has been interrupted. He has kept his Shabbat. He has kept his rest. Because what is the Shabbat? The Shabbat is us resting because we're looking forward to the millennial rest. We are looking forward to that 7,000th year of rest, of 1,000 years of rest. It is prophetic, and he did not allow it to change. We have to work six days and rest every seventh. And we, we cannot be having his fixed feasts that were fixed based on the seasons 
moving all over the cycle of the seasons. And that is why I have determined that this particular calendar that is on the screen right now is the calendar that we are to follow. And that is the end. If you have any questions, go ahead and email me at zakayapurebeforeya at gmail.com. And that's Zakaya. If you like this video, please give us a like and subscribe to our channel. There's more content in production. Thank you.